generate disaster recovery for Kubernetes. Uh, you know, let's go with that. But before we move on to the Kubernetes topic, we, you know, there's always a question because we always hear these terms, disaster recovery, business continuity, high availability. Uh, in in the in the in the recent uh, you know uh, in the era of cloud, this high availability and uh, business continuity these are the word used uh, interchangeably. You know, let's let's understand what exactly they are. You know. uh, in in today's era, you know, for for any C level executive, you know, what what is that he or she is expecting from from the system which they are uh, they which they own, right? It it need to be highly available. Should be able to react to the demand in terms of scaling, and also the disaster in in terms of some some disaster happening. So that's the basic and you know important need which any C level executive has. You know, in, you know how we how we cater to that is we we, we rely on the release automation, uh, highly available architecture. Nowadays, the the the, the buzzword like site site recovery engineer. These are the processes which we follow. That's more on the implementation side, and that leads to have you know a continuous service delivery. That's that's typical uh, crux of the story when you talk about business continuity. Uh, but what exactly is that? You know, uh, I host an application in 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 Azure or AWS that gives me ninety nine point nine nine percent availability. Will that be sufficient enough for any organization? If that is the case, what if the the region or or the data center uh, which has some kind of natural calamity and they stop working in that case the the 99.99 availability doesn't really help there you know that that is that is a crux of business category where it's, it's it's all about you know having the strategy to make your business critical functions uh, critical business function Available during and after an, an emergency or disruption. That is the the, the definition which of what we can, you know, uh, put here. Uh, uh, and then the then then what is high high availability? It, it's it's as per my understanding, it's 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 more of a characteristics of a system, which which add to your SLS. Uh, so that's that's about high availability and business continuity, and why it is important as we very well know. Disaster recovery, of course, it's as as even you know a diagram depicts it very well. Uh, the, the the goal behind is you know it's is having a disaster recovery planning and uh, you know a right tool in place so that you know the businesses continue. This is all in the context of the service level objective. Now I, I want to bring this term service level objective specifically because the uh, the the service level objective is that is the implementation or the tool uh, which will help us to decide the right disaster recovery strategy and and have the the right tool in place okay so so when we talk about uh, disaster recovery high availability business continuity certainly uh, there are there are uh, it is important for it uh, it is in in around 10 years back i i don't remember me uh, Associated with the uh, assignment, generally talk about the disaster recovery. Though though we used to talk about business continuity, but the DR plan for your system was not always been a you know a, a, a regular discussion. Nowadays, because of the uh, industry moving on more and more on the digitization uh, journey, and of course, which just to gain the competitive advantage, uh, we need to have highly available. Disaster recovery proof systems. Okay, so I I I have this reference from the market researchers called 451 Research. Uh, if you see uh, the the mission critical, business critical, and non-critical. So look, look at the first three rows, which depicts how the organization has really care about their mission critical and business critical application. Though uh, you know we still have 53 percent uh, application which are non-critical. Which are which which can afford more than twenty four hours of drive time, but the first zero depicts how the competitive uh, world it is, and just to gain the competitive advantage, it is important. Apart from that, uh, importance is also because of the finance and legal regulation. People working in the banking and finance industry very well knows about it. 
uh, we we need to make our system uh, foolproof or you know protect from the malicious attacks, application security attacks. That's the reason what we say is it is important, right? But having said that, it brings more challenges. Uh, efficiency is is the biggest challenge because the when we talk about disaster recovery, it is it is complex. Uh, we we are not talking about uh, the age old uh, single server or data center based uh, implementation it is complex we need uh, you know right skill set to handle the entire system to handle the support operation service operation and the main is cost okay so it's it's a, it's actually a trade off between you know having business continuity and the cost look at the uh, i mean the, the table itself uh, depicts you know when you have a you know lesser downtime which involves more cost and that's pretty evident uh, in that case so let's the, how how can we how can we design how can we talk a disaster recovery language and the major terminology being used in this in this uh, in this context is this service level objective uh, we we generally come across these two terms recovery point objective and recommit recovery time objective so disaster recovery is all about you defining your rpo and rto and based on that you design your solution that that is most important part many of the organization they have this process of analyzing the business impact for a system come up with the uh, you know tiers or you know they, they give some uh, uh, severity level based uh, Know, the uh, yeah they define the system you know how risky it is and based on that based on the business impact analysis uh, we we come up with the solution and then RTO and RPO is a is a, is a key points over there so recovery point objective is nothing but uh, the data which you would like to recover in in terms of disaster happens and recovery time objective is all about the time it takes to you know get your systems up and running the recovery point objective is mainly based on the the number of backup you take and how frequently you take your backup because the more frequent backup you have you have a greater rpo the recovery point uh, uh, you can get and recovery time is all about how quickly you can get your system back on track uh, so in 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 today's world we talk about stateless and stateful applications so RTO is, you know, for a stateless application, RTO really matters. That's how it is because stateless, they are stateless. For stateless, stateful application, of course, these both the uh, uh, points matters a lot. Uh, that's that's so important. In 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 the uh, uh, in in the remaining session, we will keep talking about RTO and RPO. That's the reason I found this very important to understand what is RPO and RTO: recovery point objective and recovery time objective. Now, uh, before Kubernetes or before the containerization era, or even before, say, cloud, how the uh, application or the systems uh, used to get uh, backed up for the purpose of disaster recovery. Now, uh, the simple way which yeah, we understand disaster recovery for any system is, you know, you simply you take the backup of your entire system. If something goes wrong, something happens. You restore the backup and make your system on. That's that's how that's how it, it was earlier. Though of course it was abide by the RTOs and RPO requirements uh, at that time also. The 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 first approach which uh, people used to take generally is to have a backup onto some other site, and then when the uh, you know restore it to your standby. Uh, standby data center whenever it is possible but then there are of course different replication scenarios uh, based on again as per requirement people used to take periodic backup in this case the chances of you losing the data in case of disaster is is unavoidable is is very high that can be mitigated by increasing your backup frequency but of course that's all depend upon what is your requirement at that time now in this in this strategy in this approach uh, when 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 you when you recover the system of course the system is unavailable that's how it is further to that 
in the in in the next approach which people used to take again this is based on the requirement they used to have um, in in here uh, system are getting backed up continuously but uh, in some cases whenever require with the help of some automation the the i the standby uh, infrastructure used to get back and because of the continuous backup there is a very less chance of uh, system losing the data the other kind of a workaround or slightly better approach used to have is again you have a continuous backup and have this standby environment active and not offline but active and allow the allow the environment to do the read only operation with that you still achieve some level of some degree of availability of your where user can still access the system but won't be able to write in data so that's that's a typical approach which uh, people used to follow and the third bit advance which used to follow even early days as well where the the uh, requirement of lesser uh, rt this kind of uh, approach where uh, there are at any point of time there are more than two uh, data center or, or environments up and running at any point of time the the application running on the systems has to be in a such a way that they can the they can be uh, load balanced for any user accessing the application as i mentioned it is highly complex it used to be highly complex it is it is very tricky and here uh, you know uh, the the teams used to uh, rely on proprietary technologies in terms of you know your vm replication database replication used to hear the tools like redgate talk about uh, you know database replication vmware used to handle the the vm replication these are all uh, proprietary technology which they used to uh, bring in of course there is a lot of co coordination required in this and i mentioned is complex and difficult so that's predominantly three strategies which even early days before even cloud and cloud native technology people used to adapt to that's that's how it used to be now how the things change when we talk about kubernetes and you know and before kubernetes i mean as 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 we all know it's it is it is a container orchestration tool okay so we need to talk about the container era so in even in the container era of course we borrow these traditional approaches uh, which we just saw okay but it it just that the containerized payload is way different than the payload which used to you know deploy on the server the dynamic nature of the kubernetes uh, environment makes it very difficult to have a one to one relation between your application or service deploying on to particular uh, deploying on particular server so as we know the uh, we'll 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 go through the kubernetes architecture we'll come to know why i'm saying that so at any point of time application uh, has has this uh, i mean we we always have a replica of uh, your service which we deploy in kubernetes at any point of time we don't know on which uh, machine it is running kubernetes has this self healing uh, uh, feature by which if, so, if something goes wrong, goes wrong with your service it it is still you know uh, uh, make it up and running so liveliness of the service is again being maintained by kubernetes so that makes it a bit difficult for a traditional dr or traditional backup restore uh, tools to understand it, it, it properly okay now we just talked about this there is a difference between you know dr for kubernetes uh, uh, and dr for vms of course there there are reasons to it you know uh, as as i mentioned earlier the disaster recovery solution they are mainly the machine focus they used to be always machine focus that means if you have a one server rig uh, you know you take a periodic backup of the entire server or take the uh, entire image of the operating system running on the server along the data and that's how it used to do but in the in the in the container era things are a bit different so machine level backup is not sufficient because nowadays we talk about containers and the dr2 need to really aware of the granularity of the container you know for for example i ha i have a some stateful application running in some container and it is using some kind of a, a persistent volume or a csi based driver to uh, 
to store its uh, state, right? But uh, you, you very well, you, you, you never don't, you never know, you know, what, how exactly it is managed or how it really is placed in, 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 in the Kubernetes cluster. So the container granularity or you, I mean, the tool need to aware of the container is very important. The second aspect is a, is the application itself, because uh, is again, take example of any stateful application. Stateless application is pretty straightforward because, you know, if something goes wrong, uh, the, the backup or restore portion of the Kubernetes cluster will uh, certainly take care of it. However, things are different in case of stateful application. Consider an example where you have a Tresenda database running on your uh, Kubernetes uh, environment. And uh, you know you 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 need to take a uh, and if if something goes wrong, there there is a there is a way by which even if you recover the snapshot, but there is a way by which you restore the entire database with the help of snapshot. So that's the reason this application awareness comes in picture when it when you talk about DR solution. It's it just not you know recover an OS image things like that because of the distributed feature of the Kubernetes and the container world. Namespace control is in the same line because namespace is the term or the notion which brought by Kubernetes. It is nothing but grouping of the logical grouping of the containerized payload. Uh, namespace, um, the Unix guys don't need to uh, confuse with the namespaces in the Unix. This is a Kubernetes terminology. Uh, many of the time, you know, organization have a big cluster and they provide namespaces to different different teams so that they can host their host their containerized payload. Sometimes a, a project may have a single Kubernetes cluster and have a, uh, a develop uh, the different environment isolated by namespaces. So that's the reason you know the, uh, the 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 namespace terminology is also very important and the Kubernetes and the disaster recovery tool should understand the namespace terminology as well. In in terms of Containerized application are not just deal with data, or not just you know deal with the application configuration. So if we talk about data, is a is a stateful data, persistent volumes, and uh, the the other CSI uh, drivers which we use. Application configuration which we store in config maps. We have a secrets which 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 we uh, use for sensitive information. But the DR solution need to know that when you take a backup. Of the application, we need to restore it. We need to restore whole. We just don't need the data. We just don't need application. We don't need just the secret. We need whole. That's the reason it 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 should be uh, application uh, aware. It should know the different different uh, you know different different stages where the data is stored. And because of the complex nature of the Kubernetes, if you if you if if you follow me in this. Because of the complex nature of the Kubernetes, there is highly uh, a great chance that you know if we if there is a human intervention to achieve the right backup or you know during the recovery phase, it, it is bound to create a lot of errors. And that's the reason automation is, is is very very important. And last in 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 today's world, the DR solution will also need to aware of the different cloud solution. For example, my my Kubernetes cluster is is extended in say AKS in Azure or EKS in AWS. So the, the, the DR solution should also know about uh, how to take a backup, how to provision a service, how to uh, connect with uh, these cloud providers and be very well aware of. So that's, a, that's, how, that's how I would like to you know, take your uh, attention toward how it is different than the traditional VM-based uh, DR solution. Let's jump to the just let's jump jump quickly to the Kubernetes architecture. I won't spend much time there. I I hope uh, I consider many of the people uh, attending this seminar uh, knows Kubernetes. But quick overview: uh, very important component of Kubernetes is the API server. Um, who whoever work with Kubernetes, it is the component which always comes in picture. Uh, generally user of Kubernetes do not generally talk to other component and uh, they always use the, the the command line tool and the command line tool always talk to API server. A API server understand all the Kubernetes object which we define is in a, in a declarative way. Uh, 
Uh, controller manager is the next important uh, component. It is uh, it's all about it. It manages or controls the, the the control loops. You know that that always make sure that uh, the state of the Kubernetes cluster is is as per the desired state. That's important. Of course, nowadays we have a managed Kubernetes in cloud, and uh, controller manages is extended with the cloud control manager. Uh, uh, rightly, I mean because because every cloud they have their own way to provision the Kubernetes cluster. So cloud control manager is is the extension of the the core controller manager. HCD. Uh, this is this is the distributed, highly available key value pair. Having said that, uh, when we talk about it is distributed, it is actually uh, maybe either in the in the master node of Kubernetes or it can be even outside the Kubernetes. And uh, yeah, it 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 maintains the state of entire Kubernetes cluster. We talk about Kubernetes being uh, stateless, but of course Kubernetes has its states to manage the payload which we deploy on the on the Kubernetes. So. HCD is very important. If 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 the HCD is down, the the entire cluster becomes kind of read only. You can't deploy any payload. Though you won't lose the payload. Though you won't lose the services running on it. But HCD is very important. Uh, you know that's that's how it is. Kubelet, uh, it's it's the agent running on Kubernetes node, responsible for talking to the container runtime uh, runtime and create uh, create the pods, create containers. Uh, Q proxy, of course, when, when you expose your services within Kubernetes or outside Kubernetes, uh, Q proxy is the component which takes care of communication between the services and the pod. Scheduler, important component which, which talks about how the, the payload is scheduled on different different nodes. And uh, nowadays we have scenarios where, you know, this, this, this is a big area where uh, and play a very crucial role in uh, DR solutions where, uh, and also in in a scenario where uh, the payload has to be, uh, you know, uh, hosted or deployed on a particular node because of the specific requirement, say uh, the graphic requirement, the GPU requirement, or some uh, region level requirement. Scheduler really helps in this is, is this regard. So that's that's quick uh, look at the Kubernetes uh, architecture. Now. What we should back up in Kubernetes, as we discuss about so many components, we discuss about how DR is different in Kubernetes. So, what exactly you should back up in that case? Okay, as I mentioned, HCD uh, that's the cluster set that is the first thing we need to uh, take a backup of. So, namespaces and the deployment configuration predominantly what nowadays we, we declare in, in the form of YAML configuration, this is more of a declarative approach than a imperative approach, which we uh, take nowadays. Container images, if you are not storing in any uh, public container uh, repositories, then that is the important thing. Persistent volume, as we said, the, this is just, if HCD is a state of Kubernetes cluster, persistent volume maintains or holds the state of the application and services running on that. That's most important, and the, the the though it's very tiny part, but I would like to bring the attention towards the access control, which we which we configure on any Kubernetes system, and the certificates which are play a crucial role between the communicating between these component, these major important component uh, uh, of the Kubernetes. Anybody who who set up Kubernetes in a in a uh, very Lower level way, uh, Kesley Hightower way. He has a nice documentation about how to set up Kubernetes from scratch, and they very well understand all this component. Uh, yeah, yeah, so that's that's mainly how and what all component which we need to uh, you know back up. And uh, we come across these two terms many a times when we talk about Kubernetes based payload: control plane and data plane. The so control plane is nothing but the heart of the Kubernetes main cluster. And data plane is nothing but the the application and services which we run, which we deploy on this on this on the, on the Kubernetes cluster. Yeah. Now, as we mentioned, there are stateful component and there are state, stateless component in Kubernetes. So this is again, we are not talking about application as of now. Let's just come. Let's just be aware of the stateful component. As I mentioned, it HCD 
and persistent volumes. Uh, and the stateless component is, of course, the rest of the Kubernetes control plane. We, we have a stateless workload which we put that is also, of course, a stateless. And there are certain components which are Kubernetes uh, worker node component. As I mentioned, there are certificates which, are, which we also store on the worker node, which Kubelet uses to communicate to the main component. So these are these are the pretty much stateless component, though they are very important while while taking the backup. So uh, you know there in, if in, in case of stateless component backup restore, things are pretty straightforward. We, we nowadays talk about the commandlets which we use and predominantly that the main two terms drain and cordon. You know, the cordon is all about you. I mean, why we need to train a, a cluster, you know, uh, why, why we need to have this uh, managing the stateless component being down. You know, there are, there, are, there are challenges or there are cases where because of the hardware issue, because of the network issue, certain workloads or certain nodes are not available to that. In that case, we would like to bring more nodes to system so that, you know, uh, the system or the cluster goes back to the desired state. In this case, of course, we uh, use these uh, tools. kubectl is a famous command. Everybody knows who is working on uh, Kubernetes. So, uh, cordon and drain are the two things which we generally use to maintain the uh, Kubernetes cluster. Cordon is you just need to make the particular node unschedulable. Draw a train is a bit advanced. It it goes ahead. It even evacuate the pods which are running on the particular node, so that we can take the node offline and bring the new node. And then of course we can you know have the uh, desired state managed uh, by the Kubernetes. Of course there are uh, components like certificate which I mentioned uh, which need to be taken care. Uh, and that's the reason I see automation should come in place when when we post uh, when we bring a new node. So you need to have the node having the right certificate in place. But otherwise, managing the stateless component is is pretty straightforward for any Kubernetes cluster. But when you talk about the stateful component called HCD and persistent volume, uh, there there things bit go things go a bit tricky. Okay. Now a backup option for HCD we have a built-in snapshot feature, anybody use HCD cutter as a tool, they very well know how to take a snapshot of the uh, uh, HCD volume and uh, you know restore it. We can take an entire storage volume of the entire HCD cluster and we can uh, you know restore it at any point of time. We need to make sure, we need to be very cautious uh, in the first two options. The first option, we'll talk about snapshot. When you restore snapshot using HCD cutl, we need to one one thing we need to make sure that when we restore it, the it it creates the new HCD cluster. So the 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 time period in in I mean the time period in which uh, the the cluster was down, the the HCD cluster was down. We lose anything we deploy on the cluster because the snapshot is restored. That's very important. But in case of if you restore the volume. Uh, in a highly available HCD cluster, we always have a quorum of three to three nodes of IROM. That's the RAF algorithm it it uses to you know elect the the leader. That's a different topic of discussion. But just to give you a glimpse of it, so in this in this quorum, if you bring bring back uh, the, the 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 volume which you take a backup, the the rest of the members in the quorum make sure that the new uh, member gets a delta, and that's how it uh, manages the cluster. The second option doesn't have we we don't lose anything uh, if we if we go with the second option, and the third option is of course we can always take a backup of the Kubernetes object, and this is this is this this is more of a you know a, 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 a key a, a topic which we. Uh, we discuss nowadays as a platform as a code okay whatever you deploy in in environment you have you do it by code so in a similar way if you have a kubernetes platform as a code scripts ready you know these are these are the things being handled uh, restore is again the same thing i we discuss uh, snapshot restore is with the help of hcd cattle command i i warned you about the consequence of that restoring option uh, the, the quorum take care of the delta which it lose so that's that's how our hcd and the persistent volume we we here we talk about csi and non csi 
Now I need to quickly explain this term, what do you mean by CSI? CSI stands for Continuous Storage Interface. You know, it is actually the standard for exposing the block or file storage systems to the containerized workload on in on the containerized orchestration system so uh, early days of course we used to have the, the uh, you know we used to uh, use uh, the persistent volumes and the host path and blah 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 all these things but uh, then of course uh, there is a need to standardize uh, this this particular area of of storage so that you know more and more people bring in their technologies and make it extensible so now csi has become standard okay and uh, yeah, so for system volume, we'll talk about, we talk about the CSI and non-CSI uh, for system volume, for CSI driver. For the CSI drivers, uh, there is a, uh, you know, uh, native or Kubernetes object already available for the CSI drivers. We, we need to check the documentation of CSI drivers for that purpose. So pretty much you need to define a, a, a YAML file with the, with the, with, which is of the type volume snapshot declare it, provide the other details. And that's how the system takes the snatch, snapshot of the persistent volume, which you mentioned there. And if you want to restore it, you just need to you know, declare a persistent volume claim and, and provide data, data source as a snapshot. And that's how you restore. And that's how simple it is now, now because of the, you know, uh, because CSI uh, concept is brought into the picture. But then there are still the non-CSI uh, options which we need to deal up with. And then they, they are actually uh, being taken care of by the vendor-specific backup and restore tools. Uh, I don't have a specific uh, example right now because uh, yeah, that, again, that, that will take time. But just to uh, make you aware that there are a lot of open source tools. Velero is very, very famous in terms of uh, taking the backup of the entire Kubernetes cluster along with the persistent volume uh, and then we have we have a plethora of other open source tools. We have even proprietary tools which are not paid, which are uh, not open source, like Portvax, uh, Ceph, that we generally come across. Yeah, so let's quickly, uh, okay, I don't have much time. Let's quickly bring the, uh, the other half of the topic, which is the DR strategies for Kubernetes cluster, okay? So mainly we uh, categorize the DR strategy in the, in the three areas. We can restore that we have seen in the traditional approach as well. Uh, I borrowed it from the traditional approach. We generally borrow it from it. I mean, we it's, it's there since beginning, you know, it, that's pretty simple, straightforward. Back it up and restore whenever you require. Then there are failover option. Now here, when we talk about failure option for DR strategies for Kubernetes, the Kubernetes specific thing, something picture, of course, I would like to bring your attention here and follow me when I say it. And the third and important, and is, it's, uh, it's, it's gaining a lot of popularity nowadays, you know, you rebuild entire system, you know, along with your infrastructure and platform and maintain the state of the entire system, including infra platform and application in something called as a code repository that we call nowadays, it's a GitHub as a, as a terminology, which we, we very well know. Quickly move on, the restore, as I mentioned, you back up the entire Kubernetes cluster with the help of the backup tool we just mentioned. Go for a proprietary or open source or a tool of your choice and then recover it. This is, of course, when we have uh, you know, a relaxed uh, RTO and RPO. Uh, this is something which we really uh, think of because, we, as I mentioned, it is always a trade-off between the availability and the cost. So it is still it, it still has the importance if you don't need a system to be up and running, say within three, four hours, and if, if your DevOps team can make the system restore within three, four hours, I think restore is the best strategy, which is having the lesser cost and that is still having importance in some business requirement. Uh, the other diagram which I talk about is uh, taking a backup and some sort of the HCD cluster itself. Uh, and that's how we can recover the Kubernetes uh, cluster. As I mentioned, if SCD goes down, it, it doesn't mean your, your application or your data plane is down. It's just that your control plane is down. That's the reason I wanted to bring this terminology data plane and control plane. The application services are still running, but you cannot deploy in, anything on your Kubernetes cluster. In that case also, that's kind of a disaster. You, you can't patch the system, so you better get your uh, Kubernetes cluster up and running. 
and uh, I think this is also a better option for that. Now let's move on to the failover option. And here things were tricky than uh, the traditional approaches. And would like to bring this term multi-master Kubernetes cluster. Now don't get confused with a multi-master and a multi-cluster because there's always a confusion. In a Kubernetes cluster, when we just saw we have a master node and worker node, all right? To achieve the high availability, many a times clusters have three nodes, three master nodes or five master nodes. Now there is of course a concept behind that. Why can't we have two master nodes or, or four as a, as a number of master nodes? Of course, uh, that's, uh, that's how the raft algorithm works and that's how the uh, you know, leader is elected in any, any um, environment where we need uh, multiple masters. Right, so this is a multi master kind of scenario in which uh, we have Kubernetes cluster stretched across different data centers. If you see, these are the different data centers. And as and when required, we can uh, have our uh, provisioning, or if you need extra capacity, you know, we can stretch in different data centers. Now, if you look at the, um, this diagram here, we have a three master uh, Kubernetes cluster. First three data centers have uh, pretty much payload, though the third data center is uh, utilized in half, and the fourth data center is not yet utilized. But uh, whenever we need extra capacity, of course, the, the remaining capacity in third data center and fourth data center can be utilized. The very important uh, uh, thing we need to um, uh, see, uh, need to understand here is the capacity planning. You should very well need to know the application systems which are running on the Kubernetes cluster in peak hours, how much capacity would they require? Uh, that's the important point. Otherwise, that may end up with you making your system less available, less responsible, or in worst case, it is it's, it's, it's kind of disaster for you. So the, the, the capacity planning is very important. That is one approach. So here, of course, as I mentioned, the you already have a uh, capacity uh, calculated but not being utilized in this case this is more of more for a on-prem kubernetes cluster environment i happen to work with uh, a customer in which this is the environment is to have and as i mentioned i warn you we need to have a multi-master so that the master is highly available and uh, there are mistakes being done when we when we declare when, when we provision two masters or four master now it has to be three or in, in worst case five, but not more than five. So that's one thing you need to, do, you need to understand. The, the second uh, option we see nowadays is the, the scenario where I have my Kubernetes cluster on-prem, but I would like to burst the extra capacity whenever required into the cloud. I don't want to provision any more capacity in my on-prem data center. That's the flexibility I would get if I if I need more more compute more more computing power. Let me burst out in in the uh, cloud. So that's is another failover option where you have a limited capacity on prem. You are doing your job. Um, for, uh, I mean the the system are as per the uh, running they are running as per the SLA. But in the in the in the scenario where you have a peak load, you can safely burst onto the cloud. Having said that, it is uh, of course it is uh, complex. Need a lot of infrastructure uh, understanding. Need, need a lot of uh, network engineers involvement in this case. Of course, we rely on these technologies like MPLS, uh, Direct Connect, Express Route, so that you can seamlessly create more nodes into the cloud, attach them to your Kubernetes cluster, and then manage the payload. Uh, the the one point we need to make sure that the 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 nodes which we provision in cloud, of course we need to we we will see that if they are the 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 cloud uh, region is very near to the data center in which you have an on-premise cluster running. Otherwise, it, it is still going to have a latency issue. So that's the reason it's more complex. Need better understanding. But business point of view, it it looks very uh, 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 very lucrative. Don't don't provision don't uh, plan much uh, on the on-prem uh, cluster, and get the extra compute as as and when needed. Uh, go to cloud. So it's both for failure and additional capacity, uh, because uh, if if one of your data center is down, you still need extra capacity, and you would like to burst 
your uh, requirement in, into the cloud. So it's both failure and uh, test capacity kind of uh, provisioning which you do. Uh, the the third one which we which I I would like to bring in the managed Kubernetes flavor here. Uh, uh, being from the Kubernetes background, is, the slide is a bit opinionated. I, I see, uh, I show AKS and Kubernetes, uh, the Azure logo here, but that's equally applies to um, the the uh, EKS and GKE, uh, which are AWS and uh, Google Cloud Platform uh, Kubernetes uh, solutions, services, respectively. Here, of course, uh, one thing is very sure, we need to understand this terminology of multi-zone or Availability zone. It is nothing but your virtual machine, the underlying virtual machines are uh, are of course are in the set, and the virtual machines are uh, created in different zones within the region. Basically, these are the data center within the region, but they are uh, you know uh, having some distance from from each other, and that's how we can have a achieve the high availability in the AZ. So you know, understand the AZ as a concept, but coming back to the main topic, of course, the managed Kubernetes uh, services, EKS or AKS nowadays, they also have the feature of, you know, uh, multi-zone uh, worker node. So they are, they, they, it, it has been provided out of the box uh, for a mission critical or production uh, Kubernetes cluster. That is the requirement, that is the recommendation which uh, any DevOps person would do that. So all your worker nodes are in the into the availability zone. In many of the cloud vendors, AWS or uh, Kubernetes, we at max we have a three availability zones. So that's at, at max you can you know uh, achieve. I mean that that is a max availability zone you can go for. And this is how I would like to bring this flavor, which is very important because many many times we we have Kubernetes not being managed on prem. There is a trend to I mean there is a trend which we see where people are slowly moving from on-prem Kubernetes cluster towards more more managed more managed Kubernetes services. So that's the reason this is very important. Multi-zone worker node is the key to have uh, the highly available Kubernetes cluster. And the and the fourth uh, is of course more complex than than the one which we talked about. Though we I I worked with with the customers and during the assignment we have gone through we are we have already used the scenario which we discussed in the previous three slides where the cluster was on prem and we have managed the uh, high availability of the cluster but uh, i also happened to come across another customer they went for this approach where the application itself is deployed on different kubernetes cluster now these clusters are actually in the different region so, I mean, if you see uh, as such the disaster recovery, the term itself doesn't uh, literally applies here because in case of disaster in Asia, your application is still running in US and Europe. Uh, so, uh, though it's, yeah, it's kind of a failover, but highly complex, uh, need a lot of coordination, need a lot of skills to manage this particular environment. Need to have a better automation. We have a skilled DevOps uh, engineers, DevOps team. We have a very mature DevOps pipeline. Uh, so that's the cluster of you know multi KHS cluster. So previous three slides we talked about multi master Kubernetes cluster. This is a typical example of uh, multi Kubernetes multi Kubernetes cluster, which we provision across the region to achieve the high availability. And as as we as we see, it is actually DR proof, right? Now the fourth, uh, sorry, the the third major uh, strategy which we just saw was a GTOP. That's what I was talking about. Uh, it it is it is a representation of the entire cluster state. Okay, uh, we all are aware of DevOps. We all talk about continuous integration, we, uh, we all talk about continuous deployment, okay. Uh, this is not new uh, for the people started their career uh, recently in software industry. They come across all these terms uh, uh, regularly, but this is this is the philosophy. This is a, this is a paradigm in which uh, uh, any project team would like to have the entire cluster in, in the 
in, in the code repository. We need to also make sure that, you know, not only application as a code, it is a mentioned platform as a code and infrastructure as a code as well. We know very well know the cloud formation templates or uh, uh, the Azure resource management template in which we can even provision the, the networks and subnet, uh, you know, and uh, associated uh, component like firewall uh, uh, and all. So as I mentioned, it is everything as a code. That's the philosophy of, of GitOps. Uh, people very well know from the development background, we have built pipelines for application. People from infrastructure background, nowadays they have infrastructure as a code, which we talk about uh, the infra pipeline and uh, the whole GTOPS uh, uh, term explains about uh, you know managing the uh, stat managing the desired state at any point of time and there are some, of course agents which which look at the uh, you know any change in the state of the system and they uh, quickly correct it so th this is more of a rebuild than the repair because many a times repair is very expensive, very time consuming. So why not rebuild it? And because of the tools and technology nowadays we have, uh, I've, I've, I know teams even bring the Kubernetes cluster back along with the payload within you know 15 to 30 minutes. And that's how uh, efficient it has become. And with this agent, which constantly look for the desired state and you know, that bring another self-healing feature. But it is only possible when you have entire cluster or entire system as a code is very important to manage it of course i happen to work in a in a in a project uh, this is how it used to be uh, and it was true continuous deployment for my check in for my pr request you know if if get approved it is merged and it's, it, it the changes literally used to go to the production environment and that's that's how disciplined it was but again need a lot of skills on the DevOps side and good, need a good skilled Kubernetes and DevOps uh, engineers for, for the scenario. That's for sure. Uh, I would like to bring another uh, case study. As I mentioned, I was part of an application in which the application was actually being uh, hosted on a multi cluster environment. Uh, I cannot disclose more, I cannot share more about the application. This is mainly the uh, Authentication platform from one of our client. As I mentioned, the authentication platform is, is very crucial, very critical. Uh, nowadays, we talk about uh, uh, single sign on and uh, application federation, system federation. So, uh, whenever you, you design a system, nowadays you don't talk about you know, your own user store. Uh, it is always where you would like to collaborate with the different system and need to rely on a federated user store. In a typical example, I would like to bring here is uh, Azure Active Directory, which is nothing but a user store. And when you when you design your authentication system based on Azure Active Directory, or you know, nowadays we are Auth0 and other technologies in place, it, you you don't need to be uh, worry about this uh, the, the the user store. But then it is it is very important that the systems are highly available because nowadays uh when you collaborate with different different organization and we talk to those systems the, the authentication system really comes in picture and that plays a very crucial role and uh, that's the main reason it has to be highly available and uh, dr proof so just to give, give you a quick, quick glimpse of the application the application we we are working on used to get deployed on four different region us europe asia and uh, east asia uh it was the the access to the application was uh, managed by the traffic manager that's the uh, azure dns based routing system so somebody working somebody tried to access the system from australia the nearest was japan east that's how uh, the dns based routing used to work the 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 the, the, the crucial and most important aspect uh, here is the state of course the, the payload which we uh, hosted in the Kubernetes cluster was stateless, but the state was managed in, in, in this NoSQL service of Azure, which is Cosmos DB. It was a multi-region, uh, highly available uh, Cosmos DB instances per Kubernetes instance, per application instance, which we used to host it. And the, and the most important part is, uh, which we which we need to make sure is the the state 
the state of the entire application, the, the DR, the disaster recovery uh, of the entire state of the application used to get managed by the, the these four uh, 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 the Cosmos DB instances. When, when you talk about this uh, multi-region, uh, even if you consider MongoDB, uh, which is a SaaS version of Mongo and you should go for multi-region, there is always a one write and rest of the uh, instances are like a read. So single, single write and multi-read. And again, it's typical uh, raft theorem with, by which it's, it, it elects the reader, and that's how it used to happen. So even if something goes wrong in the in the Japan East region, the application is still available in the rest of the three region, and traffic manager, the DNS routing used to take care of uh, these things seamlessly. Uh, one thing we need to also understand: it was underlying, it, it was relying on uh, the the on-premise connectivity where uh, the the organization again relied on the backbone azure network infrastructure uh, uh, which 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 handled the uh, on premise connectivity very well so in our scenario predominantly us cosmos db instance was a uh, write and rest of the instances were read in terms of uh, on prem connectivity the, the europe region used to have a nearest data center connected with the express route and the internal network infrastructure of the organization used to take care of the rest of the routing between on-prem and the cloud. So uh, that's pretty much I would like to bring in, and this is the real case scenario. Uh, and it is a classic example of you spending a lot of money at the cost of you making your system highly available. I think, uh, Aridra, we are, I think, on time or still have time. Let me quickly wrap up. Uh, so, what's the consideration? So, as I mentioned, DR, DR is difficult. DR is challenging. We need to we need to plan ahead of time, uh, and we we need to of course do uh, business impact analysis very well. You should always know there is no one size fit for all uh, for the system. So, each system has its own uh, DR st strategy. Uh, uh, of course, we did not talk about these chaos engineering tools, which are, which are very important tools nowadays. People make use of it. This is just to make sure that uh, your disaster recovery solution is working. So that brings another point is you, even if you have disaster recovery solution available, but it's, there is no point if you are not constantly testing your DR as well. So along with your system testing, DR testing is also very, very important. and uh, Chaos engineering tools like Chaos Monkey and all, they literally, uh, you know, I, I even I, I was part of a project where they used to, uh, every day they used to take development and uh, test environment down. And the next day when we start working, the, the environments were up and reading and they are still in the state where we can still use it. That's a typical example of Chaos Engineering. Chaos Monkey is a tool people use to abruptly delete the nodes in production cluster, which I, I know. Uh, or bring uh, some application component down, and that's how they test their uh, recovery strategy, and that's very interesting. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, nowadays it's a, it's, it's another uh, area, the Kubernetes scheduling, the, the scheduler uh, itself is uh, leveraged to you know host your payload or plan your payload uh, capacity. Uh, which 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 mainly involves compliance as well and the specific command on the hardware as well. So leverage the the, uh, the custom scheduling feature of Kubernetes that is also very important nowadays. That's that's how it is. Would not like would not take much. Uh, would like to share a few references um, uh, with you guys. I know it's very difficult to just note down the URLs. So I thought of uh, you know giving you uh, the the QR code. You can quickly scan it. The first one is from some some uh, fundamentals from the AWS. Second one is from from Azure. It's mainly for for the uh, highly available AKS. And third one, Rancher. That's that's my area of interest as well. So I just uh, thought of sharing these three. You guys, uh, I'll I'll keep this screen uh, for some time so that uh, you can you know take a note of it. But that's pretty much from my side. Uh, uh, on this topic. <laughs>